y'all, it's Becky here from The Becca Sphere, where we talk about climate change news and solutions. A few months ago, the International Energy Agency, or IEA, published their plan for getting the world to net zero emissions by 2050. I understood this plan as the most likely one created so far that policymakers might actually pay attention to, since the IEA is such a large source. So I asked y'all if it was something that I should cover and you said yes. So here we go. Let's start with a brief summary. Well, a summary of a summary for policymakers. But according to the IEA, the main energy sector emissions represent about three fourths of the world's emissions. This ratio includes transportation emissions. Therefore, they call for a, the 2020s to have a massive clean energy expansion and mass efficiency push, as well as mass funding for research and development, also known as R&D, advancements in clean energy technology to fill in the blanks. They then call for the 2030 to 2050 mark to be when there's a mass adoption of new clean energy technology that was brought through research in the 2020s to get us the rest of the way towards fully mitigating climate change. They estimate that 2050 should produce energy that is from two thirds renewables. Therefore, fossil fuels should fall from four fifths of our global energy supply today to one fifth in 2050, which means that a fifth will include carbon capture technology. All of this analysis recognizes that the human population will continue to increase, but energy efficiency should increase too, to kind of balance things out a little bit. The report emphasizes the need for this clean energy transition to be a way to push people out of poverty and increase every human's quality of life. The clean energy revolution should produce many strong jobs spread widely, as the IEA says, which means that they wanna make sure that those who lost their jobs to fossil fuel companies pulling back are some of the first in line to gain clean energy jobs. This will require mass job training programs. The report straight up says, quote, there is no need for investment in new fossil fuel supply in our net zero pathway. They forgive projects that started this year, but they still push for a low emissions COVID recovery with a total annual investment of $5 trillion. They and the International Monetary Fund determined that it would increase the global GDP by 0.4% a year. The report stressed the importance of global cooperation, arguing that without it, we won't make it to net zero emissions globally by 2050. So what do they recommend for 2021? Well, their main milestones this year is to avoid any new fossil fuel projects. That means no more coal, coal mines or coal mine expansions and no more oil and gas field development. Then their main goal for 2025 is to halt any new sales of fossil fuel boilers. The goal of the 2020s is to prepare for all the milestones they have placed on 2030. And here they are. Universal energy access. All new buildings are zero carbon ready. 60% of global car sales are electric. Clean tech previously in R&D stage are ready to enter the market. An addition of 1,020 gigawatts of wind and solar are added to the grid, as well as 150 megatons of low carbon hydrogen. If you want to know what that means, I did a video on hydrogen power, which you can find in one of these areas. <laughs> and 850 gigawatts of electrolyzers and coal gets a full phase out. So that was basically the little quick and dirty summary um, of the report. So if you would like to continue to join me, let's dive into the nitty gritty details of the plan. The report began by laying out how much current country pledges as of April 23rd, 2021 will drop emissions. So if we just did what we said now, how much would the emissions drop? Because most of the country plans are so vague, there's an optimistic and pessimistic projection called APC and STEPS, respectively. Both honestly don't look good, 
with the optimistic projection still reducing less than half of current emissions by 2050. Looking at the graphs, it seems that there's only been plans for decreasing coal production and increasing renewables, with tackling oil and natural gas emissions really being stagnant and little growth in nuclear. The APC projects electricity to mainly take over final energy consumption in every sector except for transportation where oil is still king in 2050 because again based on the optimistic view evs will only represent half of global cars by 2050. the apc also projects the global energy generation will almost double by 2050 which is actually higher than the pessimistic view this is due to more clean energy sources coming online and a lack of fossil fuel sources leaving. So clearly we as humans need to do better. And here is what the IEA recommends. The plan is based on the principles that technology is taken up based on costs, maturity, policy, and market and country conditions. That we have global cooperation, that the energy sector maintain, uh, transition maintains consistent energy supply to customers for a stable price, and that the human population will continue to increase and therefore require more energy generation. So the first thing we're gonna look at is pricing carbon. The IEA report expects prices for fossil fuels to continue to go down all the way into 2050, but the plans push for an increase in carbon price. It recommends advancing economies to charge 75 US dollars per ton of CO2 by 2025. Specific emerging economies, including China, Russia, Brazil, and South Africa, to charge $45 per ton, and the other emerging economies to charge only $3 per ton. These prices will then increase. For example, in the US, that means that it will be $130 per ton by 2030, $205 per ton by 2040, and $250 per ton by 2050. The IEA believes this method will result in more advanced economies to have net zero emissions by 2045. From there, countries need to start taking carbon out of the atmosphere. The IEA thinks emissions will drop in electricity in the electricity sector first. Increased efficiency. The report calls for an immediate push for all new assets and infrastructure to be as sustainable and efficient as possible. In stark contrast to previous models they explored, the report's plan has the total energy supply 7% lower than 2020 levels by 2030, despite the human population continuing to increase. This is thanks to an increase in energy efficiency and a drop in fossil fuel dependency through electrification. The latter being something neither STEPS or APC prioritized. The IEA reports project depends on this year being the peak emissions and energy consumption. It also encourages hydrogen production to be a staple co-product of fossil fuel energy generation by 2025. Hydrogen can be used for energy storage, fertilizers, and an energy source for the trickier transportation sectors like aviation and trucking. Building codes. The report dictates that all countries need to update their building codes by 2030 to create 85% zero carbon ready buildings by 2050. This means prioritizing electrification of as many elements of the buildings as possible and increasing buildings energy efficiency standards. For already existing buildings, the plan recommends increasing retrofit rates from less than 1% a year now to 2.5% a year for advanced economies and 2% for emerging economies in 2030. That would be retrofitting about 10 million and 20 million dwellings a year respectively. These numbers take into account that the fact that developing nations generally have a lower standard for building, so they need to be retrofitted more often anyways. Zero carbon ready buildings cover building operations, manufacturing of construction materials, source of energy supply, preferably PV solar on roofs, and integration within the power systems. The plan calls for no new coal or oil bo boilers sold in 2025 and beyond. The market option in advanced economies need to be only offering the most efficient and lowest emissions available by then. All light bulbs should be LED everywhere by 2025. So if you still have a non-LED light bulb, what you doing, man?
bioenergy. The report talks a bit about bioenergy, a lot actually, which is an energy source made from plants. They think it will represent 60% of the energy demand in the paper industry, which is apparently a very energy intense industry, which I didn't know that. And they think it will represent 30% of the energy demand in the cement industry, which is also very energy intensive. Biofuels can pr produce super hot temperatures like fossil fuels, and it can be used with current infrastructure. This is not completely a clean form of energy because it's still burning something, which releases carbon dioxide and other chemicals, but biofuels produce less emissions than fossil fuels. So it's still a step up. They emphasize the need for bioenergy sources to be sustainably grown. Right now, most biofuels are from corn and sugarcane, but this can result in bioenergy crops competing with food crops. They recommend moving to short rotation woody crops and feedstock that don't require heavy managed land. The plan is for bioenergy to be paired with carbon capture technology to make it a cleaner energy source. Carbon capture. Overall, the plan relies heavily on investment in carbon capture technology, the majority in industry settings or with hydrogen production. Carbon capture, or CCUS, is particularly important in the industry sector because of how much emissions come from chemicals, cement, and steel production. This means it's especially important for developing countries to connect carbon capture technology to their development processes as they continue to grow. Investments in heading towards net zero emissions would represent 4.5% of the global GDP by 2030, or $1.6 trillion a year. Investment by 2030 will be in all sectors and technological fields, but the top sector and technology area is electricity generation and the system itself. Much of the money will come from redirecting existing capital towards clean energy technology and investment from private entities, prompted by incentives from policy moves, regulatory frameworks, and energy taxes. The report also notes the importance of government financing to start new infrastructure projects and adopt new technologies. Infrastructure investment. A big part of the transition involves investing in the electricity grid and infrastructure that supports clean energy. The IEA plan calls for investments in the electricity network to triple from now to 2030. Most of this investment is meant to respond to an increase in demand that will come from providing universal energy accessibility. The plan does emphasize the importance for nuclear energy as a form of power grid stability. The authors warn that failing to make timely decisions on nuclear and carbon capture investments could result in countries having to pay more money to reach net zero emissions later down the line. For the heavy industry sector, the report reminds us that 2050 is only one investment cycle away, which is why technology in the development and prototype phase now need to be ready for the market within the next decade. So industry can choose only low emission options by 2035. The authors say, Quote, by 2024 in advanced economies and 2026 in emerging market and developing economies, governments should have in place a strategy for incorporating near zero emission technologies into the next series of capacity additions and replacements for steel and chemical plants, which should include decisions about whether to pursue CCUS, hydrogen, or a combination of both. They continue to say, by 2025, all countries should have a long-term CO2 emissions reduction policy framework in place to provide certainty that the next wave of investment in capacity additions will feature near zero emissions technology. They also call for a large scale development of EV charging infrastructure in urban areas by 2025 and for countries to invest in R&D for electrifying long haul trucks. Governments should provide their plans for decreasing emissions in the aviation and shipping sectors also by 2025. Behavior changes. The report warns that if there's no behavior changes and a lack of biofuel and carbon capture adoption, it will cost more to get us to net zero emissions. Some behavior changes include buying an electric car, taking public transit, 
or teleconferencing instead of flying to a conference. So speaking of that, how can you help make this a reality? Well, if you're building or renovating, choose a heat pump or solar heater if you can. The best insulated windows and install solar panels if you also are able to. The bottom line is try to electrify as much as you can. Then also try to avoid using a heater or AC when possible just living in your own home, especially if you don't have a heat pump. In addition to limiting hot water use, for example. And bug your leaders. Email them this plan or this video and ask your city about their plan to reach net zero carbon as soon as possible and budget for your next car to be electric. I'll tell you what my plan is, is okay, so right now I have a RAV4. I know it's not very eco-friendly. It is a 2008 and I got it when I was like 16. It was meant for my brother and I to both use. So my goal is to save up to get an electric car in 2023 because that's when the car I've been eyeing for a couple years will be entering the market. I'm kind of obsessed with the 2024 VW Buzz Microbus coming to the US in 2023, Europe 2022 for you lucky bastards. And hopefully I'll have saved up enough money to buy it by then and there'll be also more EV infrastructure in place to make it a practical purchase. So that's my plan. So finally, your favorite part maybe <laughs> is my opinions about the report. So first of all, I feel like they're putting a lot of pressure on the competency of carbon dioxide removal technology and other technologies that are still under development. In fact, the report does say that almost 60% of emissions reductions by 2050 will come from technology that is still underdeveloped, mostly being hydrogen and carbon capture technology. And that's kind of disconcerting to me because, you know, it's like that's betting on the future and for some reason, I have more faith in hydrogen than in carbon capture technology. I don't know, maybe that's just me. But yeah, that's a lot of pressure on carbon capture. I also think there's quite a lot of emphasis on bioenergy, which again goes back to carbon capture technology. Um, and again, bioenergy is not the cleanest source. Um, and they're doing things like recommending ammonia to power the majority of maritime ships. When the military has been using small nuclear reactors on their ships now for years, so that part didn't really make that much sense to me either. And they're also assuming that developed economies will continue to grow consistently as they have been, but we would have a better shot if we did something like embracing degrowth, which I talked a little bit in my last video that I just did, but maybe I'll do a whole video on it later. Maybe I'm just being naive to think that we would adopt that perspective. But I mean, the idea of minimalism and zero waste aesthetics have become more popular. The Marie Kondo organization method literally broke the internet. So it seems like people kind of want to move back to more simpler times with less stuff now that we're better understanding that the consumption doesn't necessarily equate to happiness. But also there's Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Prime Day, and haul videos. So maybe I am naive. but. It would be cool if we could just decrease our overall footprint. Regardless of what exactly we do with our plan, if we do it right, it will increase our overall economic growth if that's something we care about. And it will also help with increasing the quality of life for everyone. And I hope that governments actually are looking at this. And regardless of whether or not they will, I will be covering it. So subscribe if you haven't. <laughs> Tomorrow I will be doing the uh, climate recap video, which is usually set for like today, but I'm going to do it tomorrow. And then on um, Thursday, I'm going to be covering uh, nuclear reactors in the US with Mickey. I know I said I was doing that stuff last week, you know, things happen, but they're coming out this week. <laughs> but until then, uh, make sure to talk about climate change every single day because we need to talk about it and also support your local news organizations. And I will see you in the Becca Sphere tomorrow. Bye.